Pirates. They've been around since the beginning. But what do we really know about them? It's time to start asking questions. I'm Chris Brunt. This is Padre. Trust me, not everyone has a dad anymore. Like, maybe their dad died, like, had to go to war and died when, someone, when the kid was a baby. Yeah, that happens. Or maybe they died when the kid was young yeah. or old, and then the dad died in war. There could be lots of reasons why some, yeah. someone's dad isn't around. Or Some people have two mommies. Did you know that? Yeah, and two dads. Mm-hmm. Some people have two dads. And, right. and Jameson and Jong and Alistair are all brothers. They're three. Yeah, there you go. So families can look really different, right? Yeah, quite a good endeavor. <laughs> what do you think about our? What do you think about our family? Like, I think it's great. Yeah. Well, you have a really big role in it because you're the older brother and you're the firstborn son. Yeah. And so Nico that's like has... that's a big important. I know. Position. Nico has a smaller role. <laughs> Well, his role is different from yours, right? He's the younger brother. He's the second child. But there's still a big role. Yeah, really, it's a huge role. But really, the biggest role is mom and dad because they have to care, take care of me, Nico. And each they other. They have to take care of me downstairs. Mm-hmm. And uh, and Irie, our dog. And Irie, our dog, and they. Also, accidentally let Sophie get cancer and died, which they didn't do on purpose. Right, it was an accident. Yeah, she got cancer and died. Poor Good Sophie. Cat. We miss Sophie, don't we? Yeah, she was a great cat. She was. Yeah. A great, great cat. No, we miss her. But we we'll still have a good time in our lives. Yeah, that's right. Life goes on, right? Except when our whole family dies. Yeah, well, that's that's harder to move on from if something like that happens. Sure. Like, and that would be in a hundred years, probably. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. Growing up, my parents hated my best friend. Right from the beginning, like in elementary school, they thought he was a cocky little shit, an arrogant, spoiled, godless little rich kid. They felt that under no circumstances would he ever acknowledge or bend to their biblical authority as my parents, and that if this relationship wasn't stopped in its tracks, I would become more and more like him, harder and harder to control, and thus harder and harder to parent in the only way they knew how, which was in a no-nonsense, top-down, dictatorial mode. And they were pretty much right about all that. So what did they do? They tried to obstruct the friendship from blossoming any further. Uh, By the time they started that agenda, it was far too late. And this friendship, I mean, by like sixth grade, had become one of those crazy, intense childhood friendships, the kind that can conquer reality itself. We were blood brothers, man. I mean, no two people had ever understood each other in such a deep, profound way. We had an exalted friendship. We were inseparable. We were a compound. A friendship can feel eternal at that age. And anything that aligns itself against it, whether that's a teacher or other kids or your parents, they're villains, man. It's good versus evil. So my folks, in what was increasingly a strategic blunder, would, you know, badmouth him or or his mother, would make assumptions that were kind of off the mark about his family, which would only strengthen my sense of righteousness. But mostly they would put arbitrary limits on how much we could see each other you know, in a way that seemed punitive and petty and cruel to a 13 or 14 year old. I mean, it was like these limits were just designed to just piss us off, you know, to ruin the Friday night after the football game. We started calling them the fun police, my mom and dad. And my best friend's mom was well aware of the wedge that existed between me and my parents. And she stepped on it with her full weight. And so I bonded to the two of them ever more closely, my best friend and his mother. She was a single mom, and they had a relationship unlike any I had ever seen between a parent and a child. They 
spoke to each other like equals. They yelled at each other. They used profanity freely around the house. And sometimes as they were yelling at each other, nothing was ever out of bounds, no conversation topic or, or way of speaking. And yet they were closer than any parent and child I'd ever seen at that time. There was more affection. There was more mutual regard. And I thought all that was like very advanced and very sophisticated and, and, and somehow realer than anyone else's deal. I wanted something like that. The best I could get was for her to kind of like quasi adopt me. So that's what I hungered for. And she, for the most part, obliged. She took me in. She treated me just like she treated him. And, and I loved it. And the more I loved being over there, the more I hated having to go back home with my parents and the more they seemed like the enemy. One day I was off school. It was summertime. My parents were out doing some shopping or something. So I was home alone. I wasn't driving yet, but my best friend was. And he calls me up in the morning. He says, hey, let's go to the beach. You know, let's go down to Galveston. I said, yeah, great. Let me, let me just ask my parents. So I called them and they said, no. I said, why? Let the whining begin. No, they said, you just can't. You don't need to. I said, I'm sitting around here by myself all day. There's nothing to do. You guys aren't here. I mean, what's the... They said, no, absolutely not. You can't go. I knew that, that there wasn't a reason other than just, we don't want you hanging out with your best friend today. So I lost it. I told him what happened. And then I said, come get me. And he did. You know, but see, up to that point, for all of my nascent rebelliousness, for all the defiance and fearlessness I'm, I'm trying to emulate from my best friend, I was still really scared to get in trouble, you know, to incur their wrath. I had some sense of how bad things could get in our house, uh, and, and I didn't want all that smoke. So for a long time, it was just bitterness and resentment between us, you know. But that day, that summer day, finally, the caprice of it was too much. You know, the way they just casually dismissed my need to spend time with my friend. And I snapped. I crossed the red line, and I directly defied them. I said, they're not here. They can't stop me. And we bounced. We even left a note. This cheeky little note with multiple contact numbers, uh, you know, none of which we we uh, expected to be answered. And we went to the beach. And we had a great day. And yeah, they went apeshit. They called my best friend's mom. They yelled at her. I don't know how many people they they called and threatened that day, but they were they were helpless, really, and enraged over their own helplessness. But I felt triumphant. I felt liberated you know, blasting down the seawall boulevard in Galveston with the windows down and the music up. Like, haha, I've broken the prison walls and now there's no stopping me. Now I can live the life that I want to live. And you'll see, you'll see mom and dad that it's an even better life than the one you seem to have scripted for me in your own minds. There's this great moment in The Sopranos when Tony and Carmela are lying in bed agonizing over their teenage daughter Meadows' recent spate of defiance and the way she's acting out and they're debating ways to punish her and realizing that the options available either aren't likely to be effective or, or else aren't feasible. And Tony, mob boss, says with utter conviction to his wife, she finds out we're powerless. We are fucked. I had brought us to that point. I, I knew they weren't going to start beating me or denying me shelter or food. So once I called their bluff and realized there was nothing behind the threats and nothing enforcing the demands for perfect obedience under their roof, I won the game. You know, I could opt out of the system. We we're going to yell a lot and be mad at each other, but we were already doing that. So what's the difference? And that cynicism and rejection of authority or, or the viewing of all authority as illegitimate and kind of toothless that seeped into my whole worldview. That became kind of a cornerstone of who I was for a long time. And the rest of my teenage years was drifting farther and farther away until pretty soon my parents had no idea who I really was anymore. And it would be years before I began to feel close to them again. Many years. Now, what do I do with that little story such as it is? How do I see this as anything other than a series of poor choices on, on their part, as bad parenting. There's got to be an analysis here that's evolved from how I saw it all when I was 15 years old. 
Our stories can limit us just as easily as they can help us live more expansively and humanely and joyfully. Learning to tell my own stories with more compassion and understanding and insight can literally change my reality for the better. But at the same time, I don't want to bullshit myself. I don't want to be delusional about who people are and what they did and what I did and why I did it. What I want is something like the truth. But a truth that's somehow richer and wiser, more deeply seen and felt, that lets in more light. To help me figure this out, I talked to my friend Jamie Brickhouse. Jamie is a four-time moth champion and the author of the critically acclaimed Dangerous When Wet, a memoir of booze, sex, and my mother. His web series, Stories in High Heels, has millions of views and followers on TikTok, and he's the host of the weekly recovery show, Sober Podcast. Jamie was good enough to come on Padre and talk me through the way he tells and retells his stories in different forms and genres, always looking for that more compassionate, more vivid, more humane reality to live within. That's coming up right after this. The new memoir is, is uh, the working title is I Favor My Daddy, A Tale of Two Sissies. Love it. Well, I mean, that's not, that's the title, Jamie. We're done working on it. Like, that's <laughs> it. That's the title. Um, and you know what? I'm good with titles. Dangerous When Wet, that was always the title. You nail it right out of the gate. You, yeah, you got, yeah. you got the titling thing down. And then, so your first memoir, you turned into a one-man show, which uh, was wildly successful. And you, it, it sounds to me like you've already kind of gone through that metamorphosis with this second memoir because you're you're right you're right now touring with your second one man show, which which I favor my I daddy. favor my daddy tale, yeah. which has the same title, right? So I wondered if we could start by just kind of talking about that that process that you have, where you're you're writing literary memoir, and and at some point this turns into theater. Sure. Well, I was a frustrated actor and writer in that I really didn't pursue um, either of those seriously early on. And it wasn't until I got sober, oh God, now it's been 13 or so years, that I started writing again. And I wrote that memoir, Dangerous When Wet, which was about my alcoholism and about my relationship with my over-the-top Texas tornado of a mother, Mama Jean. <laughs> And that the uh, the the writing led me back to performing. So before the book came out, um, I discovered storytelling and personal narrative storytelling, and started telling stories and and getting good at it. Uh, you know, about maybe a year before the book came out, and then after the book came out, I was telling a lot of stories adapted from it. And and a year after it had been out, I thought, you know, I could turn this into a show. And I did. Uh, I took it to a lot of theater festivals, and, and now I'm getting it booked here in Mexico and Canada, etc. So meanwhile, I started writing my memoir about my father. The first one was about my drinking, my sexuality, and my relationship with my mother. This one is about my father's drinking, his sexuality, and my relationship with him. So anyway, I, I started writing it, and it was a little bit harder, um, even though, you know, having written one book doesn't make it easier to write the next book because you're not writing the same book. And I found it a little bit harder to get into my father because he was more enigmatic. And in some ways, what I've discovered is it was harder because I was too close to it because I'm so much like him. Hmm. And I knew that anyway, but I, I, I discovered that much more as I was writing it. And I thought, you know what, you know, I, I I'm getting, I'm getting blocked more often with this, but I'm feeling the the stories and the the performance part of this. So I'm like, I'm just going to go ahead and do the show. And it went really well. And so I started doing the show and I did the show for a while. And then I went back to the book and it's been a great process for me. So in other words, I've, I've kind of flipped the process. Yeah. So Dangerous When Wet, the book came first, then the show. In this case, the show came first, then the book. You're being modest earlier because you uh, you didn't just sort of dabble in in storytelling, personal storytelling. You're a four time moth story slam champion. You've uh, you've told stories pretty much all all over the world to great acclaim. 
Mm -hmm. But what I like about having parameters like that and having a, a, a time limit, it's the same way in writing, whereas you have to be economical yeah. uh, about what's important to the story and uh, and what goes and what stays. And, and you've know, got to deliver the garlic. goods, it's right? very much a part of storytelling. You know, like, oh, but this joke is so great. And you're like, yeah, but you know what? It's not essential to the story. Yeah. And in fact, sometimes maybe the joke takes away from the story. The stories I'm telling in these shows, of course, are very personal. And uh, there's a lot of emotion there. And people are like, oh, my God, you know, is it hard to um, perform that? You know, the, because you're not it's not it's not as if I'm an actor performing another, uh, you know, performing a playwright's piece that's not about me. And then I just have to channel the emotions to. But, you know, these are things that actually happen to me. And I live through all this. And and it's the same with writing the memoirs. By the by the time it gets to the page, I've processed these emotions. So I'm writing from a, a scab, not a wound. You know, it reminds me of. When I was in college at the University of Houston, Lanford Wilson came to teach in the theater department. He was actually filling in for Ed Albee, who, who was the kind of yeah. You know, I was going to um, Albee was the kind of main guy there, but but every now and then he'd you know he just like did you get to work with Edward Albee? I did not. Did I knew him a little. I mean, uh. I got to kind of I got to know him uh, very casually, but I didn't work with him because I wasn't involved that really you know in the theater program, which I was friends with everyone who was in the theater department, but I didn't go over there and do work myself, which was a huge missed opportunity. But anyway, Lanford, I got to know really well, mainly because one of my best friends was his like driver and assistant, you know, his sort of lackey for the semester mm -hmm, that he, or mm -hmm. the year that he was sure. there. So he ended up hanging out with us a lot. And like, he'd come to the coffee shops and, you know, uh, we'd go see movies together and, you know, just sort of hang out. Um, he liked to be around, you know, 19, students. 19 year old <laughs> students. Yeah. Um, he enjoyed our company. So, um, he was great. I mean, he's a really lovely guy, but he told, remember, I'll never forget him telling the story one time of, um, it was from the, was it burn this? Was that the big one? It was the, like the play that won the Pulitzer and he was talking to yeah, he was talking was about this. writing it. And he's like, I, you know, I was at my house. I had people coming over for, uh, for like a dinner party and I was finishing the scene where like, and it was like a family quarrel. Uh, but he was drawing on this memory he'd had of him in a fight with his parents that was really, really painful. But of course, it happened mm -hmm. 40 years ago. And he's like, yeah. and I'm writing this scene. And I, he's like, I just start violently weeping. <laughs> and he's like, and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, tr I'm, I'm banging on the typewriter. And then I'm rolling on the ground, crying and wailing and screaming. And my guests have arrived. Right. But I can't stop writing and I got to get to the end. And I'm just and I'm like tearing at my face and I finally get to the end of the scene. And I'm like, you motherfucker. And, you know, and, he, and again, I finish the scene and I rip it out of the typewriter and I just collapse in a ball and I just go into the fetal position and weep. And we're all sitting around him as he's telling the story and our eyes are wide. and We're like. So that's how you do it. <laughs> like, so that's, that's what writing it. OK, we, we haven't gotten to that level yet, Lanford. Like, how do we get there? You know, but well, I have I have a bigger question. Did the food ever get cooked for the <laughs> dinner party? I, I mean, he seemed to be cutting it. He seemed to be cutting it close. Yeah, I think it was like his partner <laughs> or somebody was out there, like you know, Lanford will be with us in just a minute. You know, as he's like woo, like wailing behind the door. You know, and I'm sure he was like, you know, I'm sure there's, a, there's plenty of hyperbole in that story, but uh, but it stuck with me yeah. the image of like the writer like gnashing their teeth and rending their garments and rolling around on the floor in agony, emotional agony over the scene that they're recollecting as they're in the act of writing, you know, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. like, you, you don't hear that, that version of, of, of writing from someone as accomplished as Lanford Wilson very often. I think, I think normally it's the sort of like recollected in tranquility, right? The emotional, turmoil or storm right that goes into the art and I, I myself have never had that experience or anything remotely like that right <laughs> like the most that's ever happened to me is like I wrote a poem and when I read it later I kind of teared up a little bit <laughs> like yeah I, I I will say I haven't had it um quite that I haven't had those kinds of histrionics when I wrote but I certainly have um had you know m moments uh, of sobbing um, you know, when I was 
when I was writing through something um, or not through something when I was writing something. Um, and I also, there was, sometimes it was a moment of, wasn't so much the reliving writing and, and, and reliving the, you know, a, a particularly emotional or painful scene from my past. Yeah. But when I, when I came to it in writing, when, when the writing came, uh, brought me to a realization mm. about those events, so like an event that I've you know thought about, maybe even told about many times before. And then in writing about, it, I'm like, Oh my God, that's what it was about. Or that's why she was so angry. And I'd never thought about that. And it, you know, and that, that can make me, that that will just, stop, you know, kind of stop me in my tracks. Yeah. And think- even if I don't cry, it's as, it's as motion as, a, as emotionally uh, dramatic um, in some ways. Sure. As what you described. Yeah. I've had that experience too. The sort of like writing to find out what I think about something, right. Or how mm-hmm. I really feel yeah. or, or, or to see something I had never seen before. And it's, and it's so strange how that, can happen in the act of writing. Um, yeah, I, I call that the revelation is in the writing. There you go. Well, what about the idea of sort of like storytelling ethics? I mean, was there ever a moment where you hesitated, where you felt anxious about telling a particular part of your mother's story, your father's story, your siblings, anything that that you struggled with? Um, I, I went through those hurdles uh, with Dangerous When Wet. I mean, I, I don't think I would have ever written it had my mother still been alive, uh, she was dead a year when I started writing it and, uh, my father was still alive. So I had to go through the hurdle of, even though ultimately it's a love story about her, but she was a difficult woman, a high maintenance woman, um, over the top, but she just loved me, you know, it was mother love at times. And so, you know, I went through the, Oh, am I, you know, am I betraying her by, uh, by writing about her honestly? So I went through that but I had heard enough from other writers and read enough is that you just, you have to get, Oh, you have to get past that, that fear or you have to put that fear aside. Even if you don't, even if you don't get over it and just write it and then decide later about what you're going to, what you're going to keep in there. And for some people I changed the names um, Mm -hmm. and I didn't show it to them as I was writing it. I showed it to them once I had a manuscript that was in a good place and maybe gave them only their pieces and said, here, I've written this. And everyone was was fine with it. But I went through hurdles also about what I was going to reveal about myself. Hmm. And I thought, eh, do I want to, you know, because I was talking, it'll, it, the, the first book is about my alcoholism. And I tell a lot of uh, uh, um, flattering stories, stories about, about yourself. My active, yes, exactly. Very flattering stories about my active alcoholism <laughs> and very funny stories. But and you know what? I just realized, yes. I held back on some aspects of my parents' marriage and my father in Dangerous When Wet because my father was still alive. Um, and I, I did it, you know, for him. And I don't think it detracted from the from the story that I told in Dangerous When Wet. I don't think it made it less of a book. And now, now that my father's dead, I feel more freedom to uh, to write about him more openly and about their marriage. So it's going to go in the second book, but it didn't go in the first book. Exactly. Yeah. There was one line that I did not keep because I thought it would, would hurt his feelings or would uh, upset him, which was that I think my mother made me a surrogate husband because of her dissatisfaction with her marriage mm. with him. Mm. I have two, I have two older brothers. My mother, Mama Jean, Mama uh, was married before my father to a man in the Air Force. Um, And they had two sons, Ronnie and then Jeffrey. They're nine and eight years older than I am. And her husband died uh, in a plane crash when they were toddlers. And then she married my father. And I am the only product of their union. And this is uh, Beaumont, Texas, correct? That's right. Where both my parents grew up and where I grew up. Yeah. So far corner, the tip of East Texas on the border with Southeast Texas. Louisiana, uh, right there mm-hmm. off I-10. And the Gulf of Mexico. Mm-hmm, by the Sabine Pass. That's right. Right in town. What was that like? Um, hot and humid <laughs> and, um, yes, and small town. My parents were very social, and since they'd grown up there, they they knew everybody in town. So, you know, the grocery store trips 
took at least an hour plus Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, especially with my daddy who knew everybody. He was called Mr. Beaumont. That was one of his many nicknames because he had these high profile, low paid jobs where he was. He was just in, involved with a lot of civic um, activities, and he was the head of the Beaumont uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau for many years, uh-huh. and then head of public affairs at Lamar University, the local university there. So, very social job, lots of shaking of hands, and not a blue collar uh, guy. No, mm-hmm. professional. No, he came from a blue collar family. Uh, my mama and papa, his mother and father, his papa, papa worked at Mobile Oil, and my my daddy sure. was the only one. Uh, in his family that went to college, he went to UT. Hook 'em horns, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a it, it's company towns out there. I mean, Mobile Oil is Gulf Oil, Mobile Oil. That's that's what people tend to do. But you're you're so your folks were a little different than most. I'm imagining. What about your mom? What did she? What, what was her deal? Was she just she stay at home or did she work? No, she worked well. She she was uh, she also went to college. She went to LSU. Was a Chi Omega. And was a, you know, did what a lot of women of her generation did who did work. She became a teacher mm-hmm. and she was a kinder, uh, first grade uh, and then kindergarten teacher. And then she stopped working when she had children. But then after she had me, she was not content being a housewife um, and she went back to work. And then she wasn't content with my father's salary because she wanted and most of their friends all had more money than they did. And so they were in that where, you know, and, and like when we had parties in our neighborhood in, in the house that I first lived in, which was, you know, a kind of a modest neighborhood, um, you know, built in the 50s, one car garages, you know, little um, little ranch burgers, mm-hmm. I call them. Mm-hmm. And but when my parents had parties, the, all the neighbors would come out and, and gape, you know, because all the cars that showed up were Cadillacs and Lincolns, yeah. um, which they didn't see a lot of in that neighborhood. And my mother wanted um, all those things. So she became a realtor and uh, started making a lot of money and became the breadwinner. And she always wore the pants in the family anyway, but then the power dynamics really shifted between my parents and she hated cooking and he loved cooking. And so he, he started doing all the cooking when she became a realtor and then she became a stockbroker and um, she became a stockbroker. Yeah. Which in Beaumont in the late seventies, early eighties for a woman to be, I mean, there was a male dominated field anyway at that time, anywhere. Uh, but especially in Beaumont, she was one of two women. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. She was one of two women brokers in that office. And, uh, she, and those two, and the top two producers in that office were those two women. So anyway, so she started making serious money. And so they, you know, they moved out of that neighborhood into a, you know, bigger, newer house. And then, and then after, while I was in college, then they built their, their dream house in Thomas Park, which was the, which was a exclusive neighborhood at the end of Thomas Road. And Thomas Road was the, uh, the premier, you know, fancy mansion road in Beaumont. What about your relationship with your parents when you were growing up? Were you closer to one than the other? What were they like? Was it a, was it a happy childhood? Oh, yes and no. I mean, I was I was extremely loved and doted on. I was the, you know, the the only child of their union, the baby of the family. Um, My father was very much a father to my brothers. They were the only father uh, they knew since they were toddlers. When their father died, they really didn't remember their father. And he didn't formally adopt them, but he was, you know, they, they called him dad. Um, although until Ronnie, Ron the roofer, Ron the roofer is the, my, the oldest of the two. And he's, um, anyway, I'll, I'll go into him later. But um, so I was very much uh, doted on and, and, and I was the only redhead um, in the family. My, my parents were both brunettes, as were my brothers, but there was redhead on both sides, redhead mm-hmm. uh, genes on both sides. Um, so they were hoping for a redheaded, brown eyed girl. Um, and my mother used to say, well, we came close. <laughs> um, but <laughs> they both adored me, my mother more so. And so I was closer to her growing up. Because she just kind of, you know, took up all the emotional space, especially when it came to me. So there was little room for him. And she also, I think, fun, as I was saying earlier, kind of in some ways made me a surrogate uh, husband, even though the two of them, they were, they did a lot of things together. And as I said, were very social and they were, you know, went out all the time and, and had lived their life together. 
but she, there was a lot of um, fighting, you know, back to, you know, Edward Albee, who you mentioned um, hit my favorite play is who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. So I love a play. And yeah. And, um, and, and Gene and Earl were the George and Martha of Beaumont, Texas. Oof. Um, oh, well, that's, that's yeah. dark, well, I mean, Jamie. Really? <laughs> it was that bad. They fought. Yeah. They, I mean, and anyone in town will tell you that they could, it, lots of people and any of their friends would say, Oh, I remember the time, you know, because they would explode. They would explode into these fights in public. Boozy fights. Is it boozy fights um, or just fight fights? Well, not, not, not that, not to the level of who's afraid of Virginia Wolf booze, but, uh, I mean, my father drank, my mother was a social drinker, meaning she could take or leave it. And, and, you know, she would, you know, have a drink or two at a party, but my father drank a lot and, yeah. uh, was probably an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. That was a source of anger and, um, in their, yeah. in their marriage. And, you know, I mean, and they fought like that. And it was back to your question. Was it a happy childhood? Yes and no. I mean, I was well loved, well taken care of. Um, I got what I, what I needed, and most of the time, what I wanted. Um, but the the fighting, you know, took its toll because they were, you know, I would hear a lot of parents where they would fight behind closed doors, you know, or they would never fight in front of the kids, or in front, where they would just erupt wherever. Yeah. And uh, and so you just you just kind of had to to live with it. I mean, and, what makes that play uh, try so? To block it out. What makes that play so disturbing? isn't isn't necessarily the explosiveness of the fighting right it's not revolutionary road right where like there's screaming and mm -hmm. throwing shit across the stage or or the film set it's the it's the cold malice of the fighting right it's the mind games and the the abusive psychological warfare that these two people cannot stop inflicting on what they're addicted to, right? Like that their, right, their whole right. relationship is bound up in this like uh, cold blooded need to kind of like destroy the other one's soul. <laughs> and yet, yes, and yet they yes. can't, you know, the, like the last thing that's well, it's a very codependent relationship. Yeah. You know? the, the last thing they're going to do is like, you know, let's take some time apart. Let's just separate a little while and see how it goes. Like that's, that's not ever on the table with these two. Right. Is that no. And you know that at the end, you know, that, you know, the next morning they're going to, well, it is the next morning yeah. when the, when the play Don ends. breaks like and, uh, just, and they will continue as before coffee. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay so well it sounds like your mother though um must have had some sort of progressive ideas at least about like the possibilities of being a woman in beaumont texas in the 1960s and 70s and 80s right did she did that translate to other parts of her sensibility her mindset was she of a, a sort of uh an outlier this is a very conservative community that you're growing up in but it sounds like yeah. your, your mother was a little different right uh, she was different in that way, but she was also, my parents were, um, they were a lot, listen, they were a lot of fun. They were very, uh, they had a ribald sense of humor, um, and love to tell jokes and love to be, uh, witty and irreverent and were fairly tolerant, but they were also extremely conservative. Sure. Um, we, they were both Catholic. I grew up, you know, we went to mass every Sunday. They were both staunch Republicans. And even though my mother was did what she did and most of her friends didn't work or if they did were certainly not the breadwinners um that she was she said she would never call herself a feminist um she she couldn't she couldn't align even though she was very much a feminist and probably you know actually doing the actions um more than 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 some identified feminists yeah self-identified feminists were mm -hmm. Um, but she just, you know, she couldn't, it was, that was too radical or too liberal or too, you know, uh, for her to, to align herself with that. And she was still very much a Southern belle, you know, she liked, um, you know, all the formal entertaining and silver and China sets and, and all that. And, and being the, um, the grand gracious hostess of the house. Uh, and my father, the same way, but here's the deal. They were always they never turned their back on a family member or anyone that they loved or cared about a friend. Yeah. If they went against those, like basically like me, uh, you know, my other brother, Jeffrey, when, you know, who was gay or he was at least bisexual because he didn't end up marrying a woman uh, for a while and went back and forth. But, 
um, they never turned, you know, they never said, Oh, I, you know, if uh, I can't, um, you can't be a part of this family. Was there, were there particular, you know, did you come out to your mother or your father or both at, at particular times or was it a gradual process? How, how did that, how did that work for your family? Um, I came out my freshman year. Um, actually it was through the writing. The revelation was in the writing. There you go. I was in a playwriting class my freshman year in college. Um, uh, where were you when you were in college? Uh, Trinity University in San Antonio. San Antonio. Okay. So long days drive from home, but not, not across the country or anything. Yeah. And they, um, and they, they wanted me to write. Um, um, and, um, and, and I got my writing talent from my father. I mean, he did a lot of writing in his jobs and he was, you know, anytime my mother needed something written, he would do it and all that. So I got my writing talent from my father. I got my drinking talent from my father and I may have gotten my homosexuality from my father, if that's hereditary. Hmm. Um, my freshman year in college, I was in a playwriting class and my parents were very excited about that and they couldn't wait to see you know, what I had written. And so the first assignment was a five minute scene. And I wrote this scene and it was, it was very much ahead of my time. It was kind of a will and grace, um, questioning gay guy and his best friend, who's a woman, the roommates in it, they get an apartment together. And so it was a five minute scene about them having a, their first party at this party. It's the pilot of will and grace. I mean, you really, Jamie, you could be a, I know I'm billionaire. Idiot. Why I didn't, why, <laughs> Why I didn't sell it? Why I didn't send it straight to Hollywood instead of sending it to my parents in Beaumont, Texas, <laughs> is beyond me. If I had just sent it, you know, so I printed it out on my dot matrix printer and mailed it to them in an envelope with stamps and all. And so my mother called, and she said, "Oh, we just we read your piece and we just love it. We think it's wonderful. Oh, I'm telling you, you should be a writer. That's what you should be doing." And then there was this pause. And she said, but you don't have tendencies like that, do you? Oof. And at that point, I didn't have tendencies. I was full-blown gay um, and had been for a few years, but I just, you know, hadn't told them. And I said, well, I think so. Mm. Oh, oh, get on the phone. Jamie has something to tell us. And <laughs> Earl got on the phone and, and he, t- you know, and I told him uh, that, yeah, that I'm, that I'm gay. Now, all right. That is how I've always told that story. And I told that, I I tell it in the book, Dangerous and Wet. And when my father read the manuscript, he said, I don't remember it that way. He said, I remember that he was already on, he said, I remember I was already on the phone. We were both on the phone. Hmm. And he was the one who said, are you writing about yourself? Hmm. Not her. That's a big difference. And I remember it because she was, she was always, she was the much more confrontational one and out there one and she was always the one to just you know call a spade a spade and 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 cut through the bs but i think she was so blind to that in me more than he was and now i think he saw it for a lot of other reasons before she did and he even said um i think i saw it in you before she did so in the book i kept both versions of it in there and basically the kind of the way i just told it now of I remember it this way. He remembers it this way. And this is why I remember it this way, because in memoir, you're not talking about necessarily just the facts, but the emotional truth. Yeah. And is it still the way you remember it or is it? That's still the way I remember it. I'm not saying that he's wrong, um, but it's, it's not like when he told me that I thought, Oh, right. That's right. right. Now I remember. But there is a truth that you want to record that your father remembers it this way. And that's, what's true to him. And it's worth putting on the page it's worth being part of the the whole story. Yeah, that's interesting. So then, what what happens after after that? So and so after that, and my mother, you know, histrionic diva that she was, cried buckets and oh, not another one. You know, <laughs> well, hold on, another one. What is who's she talking about? Jeffrey, meaning Jeffrey. Had Jeffrey already my brother. Co- he'd already come out to them. He was he was older than I. Yeah, and so he came out. He came out. He was still at that time still gay, I guess. But he had come out when he was nineteen. Um, and how'd that so go? That, yeah. Was that was that a little rockier for him? Um, I think it was, yeah, because it was, yeah. The the for, as he said, he he paved the way for me in that in that sense. But it was still emotional for them. And but my father, he took me, you know. And also, this was in 1986, so the AIDS crisis was in you know full bloom and raging across yeah. the country, across the world. So they were also terrified, sure. you know, that that I could get sick and die. And 
But my father, he took me out when I went home for Thanksgiving. He took me out to our first father gay son lunch. And he said, that's, and I, now I do remember this. He said, he said, your mother and I love you no matter what you are. And I think I saw it in you before she did. Hmm. And then he took a sip of his like second or third Chardonnay and he looked across the room, not at me. And he said, just be careful and don't march in any of those parades. <laughs> Which kind of sums it up for them of how, you know, the, the conservative side of them was like, okay, you know, there's nothing we can do. You're gay. Um, but, but just don't be, don't be one of those militant liberal radicals out there, you know, waving a flag in a G string, you know, how did you I f- did march in those. <laughs> I was going to say, whoops. Uh, <laughs> sorry, dad. How, how did you feel? But not in a G string. Uh, really? Never. How did you feel about the, the reaction? His reaction? Oh, I felt that I was, I was, I felt embraced by that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I felt I just saw I thought the you know, the the parade part was funny. Yeah. I, I I wasn't thinking okay I'm not going to march in those parades. I'm no, gonna, of course. I, but but you felt you, yeah. you you felt like this isn't embr- I mean it's pretty good for 1986 Beaumont Texas Catholic family. I got to say that. I mean that's not that's yeah. not bad. That's not a bad coming out story. I guess. I mean I'm thinking about like as you were telling the story with the phone call. It made me think of the the, the amazing scene in Angels right in Tony Kushner's Angels in America where. Uh, Mm -hmm. where the Mormon character is calling, he's drunk, he's in the ramble, right? And he calls his mother, the the Meryl Streep role, right? He calls his mother, you know, to come out to her basically. And she refuses to hear him, right? Rather than saying, Earl, come here. She's saying like, you're Mm -hmm. drunk. You're saying saying this to hurt me, right? And she kind of gaslights him. Or maybe this is not quite the right word, but she she just refuses to, Mm -hmm. uh, to- Refuses to hear the truth. Yeah. And it's hard. It's just wrench. It's it's such a more painful reaction than her even getting mad at him or calling him names or something. She just won't let him be himself to her in that moment, and it's heartbreaking. So it sounds like your 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 parents at least um, were were immediately coming at this from a place of acceptance, which which had to have been. A, Yes. Yes. I mean, my, I think my mother had to, they had to go through their own, you know, emotions for sure. But, but what was beautiful about it is that there was, there was never a question. They they never said, we can't accept that in you. Are we, you know, are, are, we don't want to hear that ever again. Fine. You can come to, we, we love you, but, but you can come to our house, but I don't, but just don't ever mention it again. Right. Or, or, um, we're cutting you off, or you just you haven't know, met was, the right was, girl yet, <laughs> or, or something yeah, along yeah. those lines. There was never, there was never a question. Here's what, here's what the beautiful thing is: no matter what their emotions or what their um, feelings on homosexuality were, their feelings for me and their love for me never changed. That's it, and I knew that, and that, and I'm very lucky because that's not true for a lot of people, yeah. and it's still not true. I was, I was watching one of your stories the other day and uh, it's, it's the one about your mother took you to rehab. Uh, I bottomed out on a suicide attempt and, um, and my partner, Michael, my, now my husband, he, he called her and when that happened and when I came to in that emergency room gurney to the news that she was on a plane, I was like, no, stop her. And it was too late because because I was hoping, I was like, ah, oh, this was, you know, the true alcoholic of not wanting to, to, to face things. Um, I just thought, you know, I don't want her in the middle of this because it's really good. Be, I, you know, because at least without her knowing, I could have, you know, kind of swept this under the rug mm-hmm. somewhat. Um, but now that she was in on it, and I realized now, I didn't realize it at the time, what I was, why I was so afraid of facing her is because I'd, ha- I'd finally have to face myself hmm. and face you know, and face the, the alcoholism and that, that it had reached. She had always been on me about my drinking. And, yeah. you know, from the time I was in high school when I started drinking and she said, you better watch it with the drinking because it's on your father's side. He and, and, and your grandfather, Papa liked it way too much. So she always saw it as a problem. But anyway, so she came, to, you know, when she heard that and terror stroke struck her heart and Texas woman that she was, she slapped on her face, you know, mm-hmm. she never left the house, not looking camera ready. And, came to New York, I was in detox uh, ward of the, of the hospital for a week. 
and they won't, you know, you can't see anyone while you're there, but I could, I could talk to her on the payphone. And then when I came home to the apartment, she was there waiting where she had been. And so the, there had already been a mini intervention um, set up and I had already agreed to go to rehab while I was in that detox ward. I was like, okay, fine. And so she, my insurance wasn't paying for, couldn't, wasn't going to pay for it. And she was footing the bill before she wrote that check. Um, she said, your drinking days are over. And by the way, suicide is a mortal sin. So it's a damn good thing you didn't succeed because if you had, you couldn't spend an eternity in heaven with me. Aww. So, yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, she also was pretty much immediately prepared to accept you as an alcoholic as part of, of, of who you were and that, that it was a non-negotiable factor of your identity. Right. Did she understand mm-hmm. alcoholism? Was she one of these people that kind of got it or, or, or was there a, a process of education? that She got it, got it. And because, you know, she, uh, was convinced my father was an alcoholic. Um, you know, I remember her always saying there's a, you know, alcohol causes a change in personality. And she said, that happens with your father. And I, and I heard him, you know, in some of their fights, she would say that to him. And uh, your mother sounds amazed. Like how is she so what she gets all this stuff? Well, I guess she saw it. And then she, she, she did her research on alcoholism. And then when I was writing her obit with my father, we were writing it together and we were, you know, pulling together all of her accomplishments and, uh, and, you know, the different boards she sat on and one, she was on the board uh, of the Jefferson County council on alcoholism. And, and my father looked at me and he said, you know, your mother said, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not, I can quit when I need to. I just don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. I said that for a long time too. I can quit anytime I want. Mm-hmm. I just don't want to. Why would I want to? And he could actually, he would quit at times because, you know, they'd have some big fight do need to say with her she was high maintenance and volatile and a lot of people were afraid of her and a lot of people felt sorry for earl you know like oh having to put up with her because she was so demanding and so over the top but um a lot of their worst fights happened when he was drunk because uh, often then that would give him the the fire to really go at her and so there were times they separated at least uh once you know after it was when he he was drunk and got into a fight with my brother, Ronnie, Ron, the roofer. They got into a, a food fight that turned bloody fisticuffs. It was harrowing, actually. It was, And she kicked him out of the house after that and, and, and let him back in only after he stopped drinking. And then he would have other periods where they'd have a fight and he would stop drinking for a while. Uh, but then he was a dry drunk because he never went. He, he never went to any sober meetings or got counseling as far as I know. And so he was just kind of angry that he wasn't drinking. Yeah. And, um, do you think that's because he never wanted to fully accept like it's first step stuff? He just didn't want to really accept that he was an alcoholic and to, to, to get. To yeah, get absolutely. Healthy. I don't think he ever accepted it. So, and it, it was just, I think for him, it was just proving like, I'm not an alcoholic because see, I, I cannot drink and, and he would not drink. But then of course he was in a terrible mood because he wasn't drinking. But the story I, t- I heard you tell on stage was about y- your experience going to rehab and your mother's involvement in that. And then you had as a sort of a mm-hmm. symmetrical experience because there was a there was a point in her uh, toward the end of her life where she needed help and you had to kind of get on a plane and uh, and and fly, and fly oh, back home. Yeah. Well, so as I said, you know, she she sent me off to rehab and and I went for sixty days um, on her dime, and that's when I you know started to get sober. But then about God, it was maybe two or two or so years after that she started slipping away uh, her mind and everything that she had been expert at uh, making herself look pretty, making money, driving started to deteriorate. And she drove her red Cadillac. um, It was her last car. Uh, She drove it through the wall of the bridge studio. She was retired then and and playing bridge all the time. Um, Didn't kill anyone because she got there early because she always wanted to get the best parking space. And then about a year later, she drove that car to the beauty parlor, but she drove and she backed into a pole, but that wasn't the worst part. She drove there sans pants. So her priority were in order, but the execution was misfiring. It turns out that we didn't know it then, but her mind was hijacked by Lewy body dementia. And a lot of people don't know what that, that is, but it's like Alzheimer's um, only it's a, it's a very 
horrible form of dementia and it mm. and um it's like alzheimer's only weirder and worse mm. um robin williams had it casey Kasem had it and when she went completely haywire my father had to hospitalize her and she was in this um, geriatric facility in uh near houston in friendswood and so i did what she'd done for me when i uh, i hopped on a plane and flew down to her rescue and it and it felt like what she had done for me in reverse and then that first visit i'm not even sure if she knew me you know at one point she she was just like all over the place you know and just kind of talking gibberish and 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 she was afraid that her worst nightmares were true and seeing little little babies in the corner and hallucinating like that that's those are the symptoms of Louis body dementia some of the symptoms and and at one point she looked at me and she said, with your pretty red hair, you almost remind me of. And then she just trailed off. And everything she said that day, like the one thing she'd never lacked conviction, you know, which was so unlike her. And, you know, and I turned um, away from her because I was just, you know, trying to get that image out of my head. You know, here was this, you know, she had no makeup on, which was never her. Her hair wasn't done, crushed bouffant, nail polish was chipped. She was in an old nightgown that needed changing. And then she grabbed my arm in a vice grip. And I turned around and she was pointing a red fingernail at me and glaring. It scared the shit out of me. And she said, you've been drinking? Oh. And I said, no, I haven't. She said, don't lie to me. And I said, I'm not. And I wasn't. And I was sober at that time, but I had been relapsing. Yeah. And I've never since rehab. And I never told her that. Uh, And I thought, how could she know? And at that point, I had mm, seven months sober. And I was struggling to finally get a year. And I said, remember, Mama, that's all behind us. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You you sent me to rehab. You, You took care of that. You don't have to worry anymore. And she said, okay, but promise me, promise. And I thought, you know what? If you can't stay sober for yourself, do it for her. And I turned and I looked her in the eye and I said, you don't have to worry anymore. And she said, okay, but promise. I said, I promise. And that moment, it was the last time that she was herself. Like after that, it was, she was never never the mother or the person that I knew. And she died five months later. Mm. And I finally got a year sober. Wow. And I've been sober ever since. And it was the last push I needed. And of course, you know, you know, ultimately you have to be sober for yourself. You can't do it for someone else or for a job or for um, anything else, but you know, for it to, to remain sober, you've got to be sober for yourself and want it for yourself, which I do, but it was the last push I needed. You know, I needed, I was like, okay, just do it for her. Yeah. Because like every, we call them cliches in the rooms, right? But like in every cliche in AA, there's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of nuance to it, right? It's, it's, it, yes. there's always variation in, in the way that that truth manifests in actual individuals' lives. And in your case, it did help. It did help your recovery to have her. Yeah. That, and it's such a beautiful, I mean, it's heartbreaking and it's tragic, but it's also beautiful, right? That her, her you say it's the last moment that she, you really felt that she was herself as if she kind of like, yeah. mm-hmm. I, I, I got one more job to do in, in my life, right? <laughs> I have one right. more job and it's, yeah. to, and, and what is it? It's, it, it's to make sure that I can help protect my son, right? I have one more job yeah. to do as a mother and as a person on this planet. And, and even though I'm slipping away, I'm going to find the strength in this moment to do this one last thing. And that's, that's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. She was a fierce mother. Yeah. I, I, I love the stories about your brother, Ronnie. Uh, I've, I've heard you tell them and just talking just in conversation, but I've also heard uh, a little bit of Mm -hmm. you, you talking about your brother on stage. And I, I love the story of your brother at, at your father's funeral. Yeah. Uh, there was a, I guess there was a little anxiety about how, how Ronnie would be showing up to this gig. Oh yeah, Ronnie. Ronnie's this um, kind of a Forrest Gump type who processes the world with a combination of childlike wonder and the brutal honesty of a drunk. Mm-hmm. And he's just you know a classic Southern Gothic character. You know he's a he's a redneck and he's a, a roofer 
um, drives a truck and he's always in his dirty roofer overalls and he loves Yamaha motorcycles. He and my father, you know, always had a contentious, you know, bickering relationship. You know, um, he would, Ronnie would, would pick on dad for being, being pussy whipped by mama. Um, you know, cause she made all the money and called all the shots and, and he was, and dad in, in turn was, uh, hypercritical of Ronnie's appearance. My God, Ronnie, you look like something out of deliverance or duck dynasty. It sounds you know, like Ronnie's the only, but, uh, heteronormative one of the bunch here, right? <laughs> like, out of- <laughs> yes, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He, he likes the, um, the gentlemen's clubs, um, over in Houston. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that actually, I had to, I, when COVID was happening, um, and I was trying to tell him, you know, Ronnie, you got to watch out. There's this thing coming. He said, well, I heard a little bit, but I, you know, I don't, I, I don't watch the news that much. And then about a week later, he called me, he said, damn, you know, that thing you were telling about that coronavirus, or whatever. He said, the titty bars in Houston are closed down. This thing is real. <laughs> so that's what brought it home to it. For some of us, it was March Madness being canceled. For others, it was uh, the establishments on uh, on Westheimer closing yeah, closing their yeah. doors. But by the way, March Madness, I used to think that was a, um, a white uh, sheet sale at, the, at, at Macy's. <laughs> um, <laughs> I really didn't know. But anyway, Ronnie, so what uh, were you asking about this, about the funeral, so, about my dad's funeral? So... The day of the of the um, Christian vigil, we called it the wake. It's basically a wake. Mm-hmm. It was happening that night, but the, earlier that day at the private viewing of the body in the funeral home, Ronnie showed up in his roofer overalls, and and my brother, my other brother Jeffrey, and I are there. And I told Ronnie, I said, "Listen, tonight we're going to be um, Jeffrey and I are going to say a few words at the vigil. Um, do you want to say anything?" Not thinking he'd want to, and he said, "Yeah, I believe I will." like oh okay and he looked down at dad's body and he said it blows my mind to think that he is up there in heaven with mama and my father and he said you know what your your father and my father are going to have to take turns with mama <laughs> <laughs> that's what you want to hear looking over your your father's body and way. he said and he said you know what swingers are I said, yeah, Ronnie, I do. <laughs> he said, well, your father and my father are going to swing. They don't call it heaven for nothing. <laughs> so I was very nervous at the Christian vigil that night uh-huh. when the priest announced Ronnie will speak. And so, you know, we're in the front row pew and all of Beaumont. He's already workshopped his material done. with you guys. So, I mean, what are you worried about? Yeah. It's going to be great. All of Beaumont is there. And when the priest says Ronnie will speak, you could almost hear the whole congregation cock their heads to the side and say, really? <laughs> Clutching course, their pearls. Like, oh my goodness. Yes. And so he got up there and he's not in his roof or overalls. He was in his, uh, wearing his men's warehouse suit that mama had bought for him 20 years earlier. So it's a little tight. And, um, and he has uh, mama Jean's um, obit photo uh, laminated and, and pinned to his lapel, which by the way, he has another bigger version of that photo uh, laminated and slapped on the side of his truck. Oh, sure. Goes without saying. Um, yeah, on, on the yeah, side of the truck. Sure. Mm-hmm. He gets up to the podium and he surveys the crowd like a Baptist preacher. And oh, and before he got up there, I leaned over to him and I said, no swingers. <laughs> and he just smiled and winked at me, which, you know, really didn't put my fears to rest. And he gets up there and he looks at the crowd. And he says, now that Mr. Brickhouse is up there in heaven. Mm. And remember, he stopped calling him dad after they had that bloody food fight, you know, years ago when my mother kicked him out. And so he started calling him Bubba after that. And my dad's family called him Bubba. And my mother hated that nickname. So Ronnie, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of Ronnie. Passive aggressive little move there. Yeah. Downgraded from dad to Bubba. That's, that, that is a demotion. Yeah. So I thought, well, at least he's not calling him dad, but he, at least he's not calling him Bubba. Mr. Brickhouse is a little formal, but, you know, OK. He says, so now Mr. Brickhouse is up there in heaven. The first person to welcome him is going to be my father. And I thought, oh, God, no. <laughs> and he's going to. I said, don't thank Mr. Brickhouse for marrying my mama and taking care of her two little babies, my brother and me, and for giving us a beautiful baby brother. Aww. And I'd personally like to thank the man for all he's done for me and for always being a father to me. Well, at this point, holy shit, 
like the whole congregation is hanging on to his every word. They're kind of like blown away because nobody thought, you know, expected this from Ronnie. And he said, and the personally, the way I see it, I think the man just got a promotion from earth up to heaven. And I was like, wow, I underestimated Ronnie. Dad, and I was like, God, if dad had only heard that when he was alive, because he was, even after Mama Jean died, dad never stopped being a father to him, even despite their differences. You know, he always made sure he was taken care of. And when his roofing business was in a slump, he paid his bills and, and made sure he was fed. But he always, you know, he was pissed off that he never got the gratification, the, the gratitude or the respect yeah. that. He thought he deserved caring for him through through. I would imagine some gritted teeth, right? Even as this relationship yeah. has become uh, contentious, you're still gonna when it really matters, you're you're there for him. Yeah, yeah. When you tell stories about Ronnie, I feel like so often the, um, the sort of the interpretation that you give it is uh, it's a very generous one, and, and it usually is to some effect of um, you having underestimated him in some way and him kind of rising to the moment. I mean, clearly that's what the, fu the, mm -hmm. the funeral story is about, but I've heard you tell other stories about him where that also seems to be the case. And I just think it's interesting the way that when you, when, when you kind of pour your, your life experience with this particular person into the kind of storytelling craft, the meaning that seems to rise up for you is the sense of like, this person is greater than the sum of their parts, that there, that there's something about them that constantly surprises me and that, that, I don't know. There's aspects to this person that, that I don't always, you know, immediately perceive or expect to, to come out. And I think that's really, it's really lovely way of, of, of seeing your brother, of seeing people in general. Thanks. That's a great, um, very beautiful and apt and eloquent description of, of Ronnie. There's a sweetness to the way that you, you tell the stories of your family that uh, even though the stories are bawdy and they're, you know, there's dark humor and there's real pain and suffering in, in, in everybody's story, there's a sweetness and a, and a lovingness that, uh, that comes through in, in the way you talk about your family. And I think that's, it's just, it's part of your, um, what makes you such a, a, a wonderful storyteller, Jamie. And a great guy. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to get that, get that in paper on, on get that in print. Man. You got blurbs, whatever you want, man. I got it. I'm ready. Jamie Brickhouse. Thank you so much for being here, joining us on Padre. Thank you, Chris. Um, and, uh, and I'll just tell the um, listeners, they can follow me on TikTok at Jamie underscore Brickhouse. And my website is, is, is Jamie Brickhouse. You can find out what's going on with Jamie Brickhouse. Show dot com. Book wise. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Here's another version of that story I told you at the top. Growing up, I had two parents, and they loved me with all their hearts. And because I was adopted at birth and a closed adoption, and probably for other reasons which I can't see as clearly, they were afraid from the first day I came home from the hospital that they wouldn't get to keep me, that someone or something would take me away from them, or that I would grow into someone who would reject them that one day I'd say something terrible and take off and never return. And there were other things going on in our family that took up a lot, maybe even most of their attention and weighed them down with stress and suffering. And I, I didn't like the way they handled any of those stressors. And we fought over that stuff too. But mainly we fought over how much they wanted to control me, isolate me, keep me theirs. And then I made a friend who represented everything they resented most in the whole world. A cocky kid who didn't have an obedient bone in his body and didn't go to church and reeked of superiority and was rewarded for it at every turn. And that kid's mother, who had totally different values from them, a totally different manner and personality and parenting style that clashed with theirs, she went out of her way to bond with me. It's impossible to believe they didn't see and weren't wounded by my affinity for her and her son and the way they lived, the way they spoke, the way they moved through the world. And aha, here it is. It's happening. I'm leaving them. And so they try to batten down the hatches even more. And that only makes it worse. And they lash out at my friend or his mom or at me. And that makes it worse too. And every button they push or lever they pull produces the same effect. I grow more and more distant, more and more resentful, 
more and more secretive. See them less like my parents and more like an institution I'm trying to escape. But they never stop loving me, providing for me, showing up when I need them. They never kick me out of their house or send me away from them. Eventually, they even learn to suffer through encounters with my best friend or his mom with a kind of grim politeness or even a forced pleasantness. And I won't ever know how much it all hurt them or what else was involved in their emotional calculus during those years. I know that after college, when I left the country for Argentina without much of a plan or much money and without a return ticket, I didn't have my luggage for about three weeks because the airlines lost it. And when it finally came, I was living in a hostel in Buenos Aires, and I opened up my suitcase and I found this envelope that my mother had slipped to me when I'd said goodbye to her back in Texas. And I opened it, and I found a short letter and a hundred dollar bill. She wrote that from the time I was a little child, she'd always known that I would go on a long journey away from her, that my life would take me far from home, but that I should never forget that she was my mother. And she loved me more than anything in life. And that would never, ever change no matter where I found myself or who I became. And here's a little money that she saved. And I should put it away and hold it in reserve in case I get myself into any trouble. and need to reach out to her. Because she'll be there for me. Now listen. I took that hundred bucks. And I promptly spent it on booze and cigarettes and wild nights in strange cities. But I've never forgotten that she gave it to me and what it meant. Seems like you know who the winner is. Who's the winner? Are you, or are you the winner? I mean, are you? Maybe we were all the, the, winner. the winners all along. Hmm. <gasps> Maybe everyone's a winner. Oh, I can cover your ears. Okay. That's our show. No Nat Fatwa award this week, but you can write to me at chris at padrepod.com. That's chris at padrepod.com. Tell me about that father in your life who did something that wasn't terrible in at least one instance. I'd love to hear about him and his particular triumph and maybe even confer on him the greatest and most prestigious award in global fatherdom. That's chris at padrepod.com. Be sure to also leave us many, many stars and reviews at Apple Podcasts or wherever you're downloading us and subscribe to the pod so you never miss an episode or an update. Join us next time when I'll be talking about gender, marriage, co-parenting, and the psychodynamics of family life Ooh. with the literary critic, Dr. Monica Gellowat. See you then. Padre is created and produced by me, Chris Brunt. Original artwork for the show is by David Wojo. Special thanks to Brad Franco and Julian and Nico Benz-Brunt.